Winning Plays is brought to you by FanDuel, the exclusive wagering partner of the CLNS Media Network. Winning Plays podcast back yet again, and we have a game seven, <laughs> boys and girls. The Celtics <laughs> will be heading back to Boston after pulling out a 95 86 win. <laughs> My name is Brian Robb. I'm in Philadelphia. I'm joined by Sweetie Tirada of MassLive.com, who is also in Philadelphia, fresh mm-hmm. off the Celtics pulling out a win out of their pretty much out of their ass at this point. But this is uh, we have a lot to get into here, Sweetie. Uh, a lot of storylines from this game. Um, where, but we have to start with Jason Tatum, obviously coming off the top with uh, 16 points in the final four minutes of that mm-hmm. game to. Uh, Pretty much get to the Celtics to the finish line there. What uh, what stood out to you most about his night, and uh, what what happened there down the stretch? Uh, Big up. I think we should mention that he did so humbly. Everything he did so humbly <laughs> yeah. today. Uh, I didn't realize this, Big Rob, but on the way on the Uber back home, Jason, sixteen points as you said. He outscored the entire Sixers team, sixteen thirteen in that fourth mm. quarter. Like that's insane to me. Like especially with the way you know he was going, and some it, there was like some stat basically. Um. I should, probably should have had it ready, but it was just it was like the first Celtic ever to like score three or less points or something and so outscore the entire point in the fourth quarter. Uh, and so one, I was, you know, I think I remember at like the five minute mark, I was just taking notes and I was like, like, you we were there, like Wells Fargo today was awesome. You know, the crowd was awesome. Uh, it was like this hostile atmosphere. Like you could feel the tension in the air. It's like one of the, you know, one of the best things about playoff basketball. And I remember being like, who's going to step up at this point. Right. Cause like Marcus can only do so much. And I'm sure we'll talk about Marcus more. I thought he was the MVP tonight. He played awesome. Um, but I was like, who, who's going to, who's it going to be today? And it was Jason Tatum. Right. And I just think, you know, I think I tweeted like I, each one of those three pointers was just cold. It was just ice cold. Like he, he, he stepped up in a way I don't think anybody uh, expected him to. He kind of saved his legacy, um, you know, not like long-term legacy or anything, but I think he saved himself and the Celtics from just this like very negative narrative all season. Because if they had lost B-Rob in the way Jason played, can you imagine the outside noise? We're not even talking just Jason. We're going to be talking about like, we would be talking about Jalen all out in the He's going to be here in Boston long-term. We're going to be talking about the core. We're going to be talking about Joe Mazzula. We're going to be talking about can Jason Tatum beat the number one often um, and all, all these things, but he, he saved himself and the Celtics and in some way the fans from all of that. So it was just a performance for <laughs> the ages in the last four minutes. It was not the 46 point game from last year or however many it was, but I think uh, Celtics fans can appreciate that one. Yeah, there's no question. The, the, the toxic storylines would have been uh, through the roof after <laughs> if, if things did not mm. uh they did not write the ship midway through the fourth quarter there but um yeah it was i think to your point on smart i think that's that's the mvp of this game like mm-hmm. that he kind of i i i mean we were talking about out of the way out of the arena i think i think that was probably his best playoff game ever i mean he's mm-hmm. sure he's had better box score lines in a playoff game but in terms of mm-hmm. what he did from a defensive impact perspective the big shots he made, just making right decisions. There were no shots where you're like, no, 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 Marcus. There was like none of that in this game. This was, he was the one who was kind of steady to ship throughout. He had a couple, hmm. you know, iffy turnovers in the fourth quarter, but that, you know, that's just, th- those are going to happen. But everything else he did in this game, um, and the Celtics needed all of it to kind of yeah. survive this all. And I think what also, not just him, but the entire starting five looked, kind of rejuvenated with Rob Williams mm-hmm. back in the folders. So that was the, that was a big chess move there. Um, clearly everyone was excited by it. Um, mm-hmm. from talking about the game and I don't know if <laughs> you like, do you think, do you think just doing that? Is it like, is this, did that just give this team like a burst of energy just to have like Rob, mm-hmm. which is kind of ridiculous, but it, I guess that they love him that much that it, it could be the case. Yeah. And I thought, right. Rob also needed to step up today, and I thought he did so. And he was cl- a clear game changer right from the beginning. Um, one one quick thing I want to add about Marcus is like I thought because he hit Rob for like three or four lobs, you know, not all of them worked. Uh, the one where he basically like he hit the rim on a lot, and we were like, oh, what, what was that? You know, so that was a little bit weird. But I thought that was like really important just to keep the 76ers on their toes. Like, hey, like Rob can still go up and get it, and I thought that kind of changed things going from there. 
Um, in terms of Rob, like like you said, B-Rob, like everyone, you know, was super happy about it. I think that was like the big switch we saw. Um, and it was, you know, it felt a lot more calculated uh, because it was the double big lineup compared to, hey, stay throwing in Peyton Pritchard in game five and seeing what we got to work with here in the second half. Uh, so, I'll, you know, I thought it was twofold. Like Rob needed to show up, but at the same time, like you could tell, like you said, they were rejuvenated. And, you know, I was joking about it with whoever was sitting near me, like, who would have thought the juggernaut, you know, double big lineup that worked so well last year uh, could work well again? And, and you know, it was a fair question, right? I think it was the same 76ers team, uh, I believe, right after the All-Star break in February. Like, they did, they kind of, like, neutralized that double big lineup. So going into the game, I was a little bit, like, I was a little bit skeptical um, just because they just hadn't played that much this season. It, it didn't, it wasn't necessarily the greatest uh, when it did play, but they stepped up. Um, I thought it kind of changed the the intensity of the game, especially, right? Uh, you know, holding a team to 86 points, that takes hard work. Uh, you know, they don't, I think I I was shocked when I was writing, you know, kind of rewriting my game after the game, but Sixers only scored three points in the last 557 of the game after the maxi weird free throw stuff. And the alone field goal was, you know, in garbage time. Uh, the fact that there was a garbage time in this game is also weird, B-Rob. But um, if the Celtics can get this Rob game in and game out and have him be a contributor, I think, uh, you know, that's just another wrinkle, uh, one of the many multiple identities Joe Missoula said. So I thought, uh, but clearly the players loved it. And I think the fans can, uh, can love that a little bit more too, just because Rob is uh, adds such a different element to this group. Yeah, he finished 10, 10 points, nine rebounds, 28 minutes, team high, plus 18 in those 28 minutes. Yeah, I honestly, like, I mean, I talked to Frying before game six um and we both wanted them to lean into more offensive looks because you could go two ways here obviously you go the defensive heavy and that's you move rob into the starting five but to your point like that wasn't a group that necessarily we hadn't seen them flash back to what they were last year during this regular season so this was a a game but with that said that was something where they pretty much hadn't tried it at all in this series and so no no doubt you're like you're gonna see what it looked like and making coming out of the gate with it it make a strong case right because you know pj tucker's gonna be on the floor and that's where you can hide rob and there was a bit of a a, a chess match a cat and mouse game between joe missoula and doctor in the fourth quarter when tucker came on and off the floor and rob pretty much followed him on and off there too mm-hmm. but it's a situation where i just didn't know this team had this level of defense in it and i i you yep. give you give the defense a lot of credit this is also a huge choke job by the Sixers. Let's so like, not like, it's <laughs> job. like they, they were in position to take this game. The Celtics were trying to give them this game mm-hmm. pretty much the entire second half before Tatum caught fire <laughs> late and they did not want it. And mm-hmm. so where, what, how do you d- divvy that up? How much credit do you, are you giving the Celtics here versus uh, James Harden kind of showing his true colors and <laughs> the Sixers supporting cast kind of falling on its face? Yeah. Four for 16 from Harden is uh Five turnovers, you know, nine of this, I guess. But yeah, I, I think you have to give the Celtics credit though in the sense of like, I thought it's important that they finish it off in the terms of like grinding them down, right? Because the Sixers, to be fair, scored 30 points in the third quarter. It looked like they were rolling. But I think the fact that they that they finish it off like that, like sure, you know, like you said, like the Sixers absolutely choked down that line. But like realistically speaking, like I personally thought that the fact that Jason Tatum was one for 14, which like, let's be real, like how many times is that going to happen in his career? And it was still like, they're still training buckets in the fourth quarter. I thought if you're a Sixers fan, like you, you were just hoping that Jason didn't catch fire and he ended up doing so. So in terms of the video credit though, I don't know, like maybe like 60, 40, like I thought the Celtics <laughs> played pretty well, but That's at the same right. time, like, you know, the Sixers did, did, you know, kind of shoot themselves in the foot a few times, but well, uh, <laughs> we'll see if that continues. I think, uh, it kind of felt like a desperation move, right, B-Rob? Like, you're facing an elimination game on the road, hostile environment. You played so horribly in game five, but it worked. And uh, I think uh, you, you have to, you know, as much as as much criticism as Joe gets, you, you, have to, you have to give him his credit here because he did push the right buttons. Make a fast break to FanDuel during the NBA playoffs because right now new customers can get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's $1,000 back in bonus bets. If your first bet doesn't win, you got to get the app. The app's the way to go. It is so easy to use. You get great promotions every day with the app. It's safe and secure, and you get paid instantly. How about that instant cash with the FanDuel app? There's no better place 
to bet all your playoff action than America's number one sports book. Visit FanDuel.com slash Boston and get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's FanDuel.com slash Boston. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of the NBA. 21 plus in select states. First online real money wager only. $10 deposit required. Refund issue is non withdrawable bonus bets that expire in 14 days. Restrictions apply. See full terms at FanDuel.com slash sportsbook. FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with Kansas Star Casino, LLC. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit FanDuel.com slash RG. Colorado, Iowa, Michigan, New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Tennessee, and Virginia. 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text NEXT STEP to 53342 in Arizona. 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat in Connecticut. 1-800-9-WITH-IT in Indiana. 1-800-522-4700 or visit ksgamblinghelp.com in Kansas. 1-877-770-STOP in Louisiana. Gambling Helpline MA.org or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support in Massachusetts. Visit www.mdgamblinghelp.org in Maryland. 1-877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY at 467369 in New York. 1-800-522-4700 in Wyoming or visit www.1800gambler.net in West Virginia. Now let's get back to the show. Well, I think what ultimately the move did more than anything else was like, it allowed Al Horford to be a lot more aggressive defensively of him. And I think from a strategic defense standpoint, like who are you more worried about going into this game and beat or Harden? Mm -hmm. And I think the Celtics probably made the wise choice here that like, at home into like who are you more scared of you're more scared of Embiid right now. Like Harden's had big games in the series, but he's also had absolute <laughs> clunkers and they didn't, and they locked in well on, on Harden in this game. But um, by Al really knowing that Rob was back there and ready to help when, you know, on those drives to the rim, mm -hmm. I think that made it, that led to a lot of steals that led to a lot of, you know, good contests there Embiid never really got a great rhythm in this game, never got to the free throw line a ton in this game. Mm -hmm. And it was an efficient night for him, 26 points, 10 rebounds, nine of 19 shooting, but ultimately like, and never felt like he took over the game at any point there. And so that um, really opened the door for the fact that the Sixers supporting cast were going to have to get them there. And they just, they, they weren't up to the task. Yeah. And, and I think it's important not to lose the sight of the fact that, the Sixers missed a lot of open shots, and they only shot 23.5% from three. Red Celtics finished 42.9. Actually, the, the, the one thing I do want to say, B-Rob, uh, I don't have like, the, the exact the most efficient numbers, but they started some, the Celtics started something like 9 for 12 from three, right? And I yeah. believe they were like 11 for 29 at one point. So they went, like they had a pretty a, long stretch yeah. there. It was rough. Was that two for 19? Yeah, so that was like, ooh, I don't know about this. Obviously, there was those percentage points as one up uh, once Jason started hitting some. He did finish four for 11 from three. Um, but I just thought, like, defensively, we have heard this over and over, and I think it was more last year, right? Like, just the comfort the guys on the perimeter are getting when they know Rob is, like, roaming back there, and he's, like, the second line of defense, right? And, you know, that's kind of a double-edged sword, right, throughout the regular season they talked about. It. It's like, you know Rob is back there, so maybe you're not playing as hard because, you know, Rob will clean up some of those mistakes. But like when you can play aggressively, like like you mentioned, like with Al on Embiid and, and other guys too, right? Um, we saw right off the gate, like there were a few times, I think it was like Maxi or someone, he was right near the rim um, trying to attack, but then they saw Rob. Like Rob just has that presence. So I think it's just one of those factors where maybe subconsciously it, it, you do, it does affect how you play on the perimeter. And, and we saw that get gashed a little bit in game five. So I think uh, – all good things. Um, I don't know how the 76ers adjust from here, but uh, if you're a Celtics fan, obviously you're feeling pretty good going into game seven, much like last year against Milwaukee. Yeah, I mean, when you when you survive a 5-for-21 night for Tatum um, mm -hmm. and you're going back to your home court, you're obviously feeling good. Al Horford, obviously, 
he had a great defense tonight, but only one of five. You got nothing from him offensively mm-hmm. as well. You got great nights from Marcus. You got a great night from Malcolm Brogdon. Mm-hmm. Um, the four turnovers. I mean, everyone turnovers were a huge problem all night, but he hit his three as early. Derek White is three as early. Like those guards really, mm-hmm. you know, built that lead and got them, you know, and did a pretty good defensive job on Harden. And even Maxi, Maxi had a pretty good night overall, but you know, he never got fully cut mm-hmm. loose. But you're right. Like, what what do you do if you're Doc Rivers right now going back here? You the he played, you know, nine guys off the bench, real minutes. McDaniels mm-hmm. is still not playing. Daniel House, you know, you he just didn't you didn't get the the huge big night from a random guy on the bench this time. And I think <laughs> expecting that in game seven, it's just like it's mm-hmm it's you're on thin ice if you're if you're the Sixers here. Yeah, I mean, for example, like Melton went 0 5, 0 for 3. Remember how he lit up game yep. one in the first half? And we were like, oh, okay, this is a I think that was right when you were like, oh, this might be a much longer series if they're gonna keep shooting like that. And I don't know, B Rob, I, I like the obviously the kneeing um for Tucker kind of adjustment worked for a little bit there, but like right. Hey, I just, like you said, like, you need that kind of random game, I feel like. Like, Daniel House was obviously awesome last game in game five, but that, he, you know, he only played seven and a half minutes, and you're kind of like, okay, he doesn't have as much juice as you expect. So, I think it's like, you just need, like, a better knife from, like, Tobias or someone. Um, I do want to... He's talking... I didn't realize how bad he was. Yeah. One of seven. One for, yeah. Uh, I don't know. Tobias is one of those guys, like, he's obviously going to, like, add a little bit, but I feel like he's just been kind of... He's felt a little bit more invisible this series than I expected. Um in that regard. So, but I, you know, like you, you know, I just want to say like Maxi has been way more impressive this series to me. And I hear he's a great guy from a few Sixers writers. So I like that, but yeah. I thought this was kind of a matchup like nightmare for him. Just like, because obviously he's a very quick guy, but like, you know, against the Celtics earlier this season, like he struggled against some of these beefier guards, but he's been able to use that speed while, you know, he had that wide open dunk, I think like midway through the third quarter when I was like, Oh, okay. <laughs> Celtics might be in trouble here. So um, it obviously worked out, but like you said, I don't know what adjustments you make if you're the Sixers. Um, and to be fair, Doc, I think hasn't been doing like a terrible, terrible job this series. Uh, but we'll see. Uh, we'll see if he has any last picks up his sleeve. And I think that's like a luxury for the Celtics, right? Like, remember last season we were talking during the finals. I remember, and we were like, "What adjustment does Eme make here?" And I think it was something like play paid and Pritchard a little bit more, and he kind of ended up doing that in like game. I want to say like six or something. Um, you know, that's a luxury for the Celtics. Like, you know, you're only going seven deep. But when you can put up when you can put out a guy like Rob and he can make that kind of impact, like once again, it comes back to the fact that this is a very talented roster. It's a very deep roster. And uh, when you can have those options, right, like we always say, it's all about matchups. Like maybe Rob isn't, you know, maybe you can throw Rob out there and he can contribute. So it's just one of those things where you're like, OK, you feel good going to game seven. But as we talked about B-Rob, like you never know this. You never know with this team, I feel Dude. like. Right. We, we, we said the same thing in game five. Can't really anything out of this group. It'll be it will be interesting. Like when you go back to game seven at home now, the seven man rotation work tonight makes complete sense. Mm-hmm. That those are your clearly your seven best players, and you're going against in a hostile environment with the shift in your starting five. So you're they rolled with that. But I do wonder on the friendlier home floor if like if if Joe does go deeper into his bench because mm-hmm. for that game for and energy left. I mean, that's, that's going to be a totally feel thing for him, but mm-hmm. for, uh, you know, he's taken his lumps in this series, um, rightfully so as Mike Marcus smart put it. Um, but I think, I think he managed this game. Well, I think game six, you know, mm-hmm. the, the offense was a mess um, for the, <laughs> for the final three quarters, but I don't think that's on mm-hmm. him. I think he made the calculated effort to be like, we're going to win this game with defense. And mm-hmm. he played the right cards late to do it. And, I think he played the right substitution game in the fourth quarter too to, you know, not yeah. stick with Rob out there when Yang was out there and just kind of, you know, let Doc pick his poison there and like the, the matchup either way for lineup wise, whether it was Brogdon or or him in there late with the rest of the, that lineup. Mm-hmm. And once again, if Jason Tatum has even like a bad Jason Tatum game, I think uh, I think this wasn't maybe as close as it was in the fourth quarter. So. Is right. I mean, and you have like, is Jason, Har- is James Harden going to four of 16 again? You're like, oh, well, actually, it's like a 50 50 chance he will, <laughs> based on all this. Yeah. Things. I mean, you know, two and three, he sucked. In game six, he sucked, you know. Um, so, but he's probably going to need 40. He's probably going to need 40 in game seven for them to do it. But he could, I mean, again, yeah. he could do it. Embiid can obviously I mean, do it. Uh, 
Yeah, Rob, obviously you and I are very happy about two days off, Saturday, Friday and Saturday here. So I'm sure uh, the players are also happy to get an extra night's worth of sleep before game time. So. They really do. All right, well, we'll be back after that one to to react on Sunday night. We don't even know the game time yet. It's either going to be 3.30, 8 o'clock, based on what happens in this Warriors-Lakers game mm-hmm. on Friday night. But um, Suichi and I will be all over it at MassLive.com. Make sure you are following Suichi on Twitter as well, at S-O-U-I-C-H-I Tirada. Um and yeah, what's we'll wrap up here. What what's the prediction here? Are we are we going to Miami or New York Suichi or is this uh is this right <laughs> end? I think so. Um I was very wrong about today though. I thought the Celtics were in a blowout. Um just because that's kind of the team they are. Uh I guess nine point game with a uh, Sixers only score eighty six is a little bit uh mid two thousand, so who knows? It's not nine points in the current NBA landscape, so we'll we'll say I was half correct. But I do think the Celtics will win game seven. <laughs> I'll be heavily fair to do so. And um, yeah, well, it should be, it'll be a fun ride either way. But meantime, thanks for listening. And thanks to Suichi for hopping on. And we'll be back again one way or another as we get our first game seven of the Celtics season. Stay tuned. CLNS Media Celtics coverage is brought to you by FanDuel. New customers get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. 